Welcome to the underground, the Steel City Underground, the black and gold standard for Pittsburgh Steelers coverage. Now, here's your host, Brian E. Roach. Hey everybody and welcome to another edition of the Steel City Underground video podcast, your black and gold standard for the Pittsburgh Steelers, brought to you in part by StubHub. Take a night off from a night in with amazing tickets to amazing events. You can go to steelcityunderground.com backslash tickets to find more information. Uh, my name is Brian Roach and I am the host who doesn't like toast, the man with no plan. I am here for our inaugural edition, our very first episode of dun, 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 Fan Mail. Okay, that's my great introduction to this. Uh, the idea that uh, Joe and I have been tossing around for a while is that we would like to take and bring the interaction between us and you guys, the fans, um, to another level. So what we did is we have a Steel City Underground hotline, which is 203-900-4SCU, which you can call and leave messages on. Or we have a email address, fanmail at steelcityunderground.com, where you can send emails. Now, we're not going to just use those two venues, though. We're going to use the comments that you sometimes put on our article posts or even on these video posts. And so for our initial inaugural edition, I've gathered a variety of different comments and questions from a variety of different places. And, you know, we're going to go with that. Now, ideal here is we were going to rip off the Letterman, the David Letterman uh, bit about viewer mail, and I was going to shake some papers at you and go actual mail from actual viewers, listeners, readers. But I don't want to kill any trees didn't seem economically sound to waste paper or ink so I'm just gonna stick digitally and not wave paper at you I'm sure you're thrilled and happy so I've got a bunch of questions we're gonna get to um, and we'll see how this goes and hopefully you guys will get into this and you'll start shooting us emails and other questions that we can answer you can even ask us anything you want as we've said before you can ask us anything you want you want to ask me why I'm such a doofus you can ask me why I'm such a doofus um, I, I don't know that I can answer that actually because I how do I know why I'm a doofus you want to ask me why I like Neurosonic you can ask me that and of course hopefully if you want to ask us about the Steelers you can do that as well so to lead off our first question from the first edition of fan mail is from Jeff Stipp. And Jeff asks, with the Steelers losing Jarvis and Timmons in free agency, does that mean they get a compensatory to cop gosh, could I say this word compensatory pick? Do they get an extra pick in next year's draft draft? Okay. The question is a viable one, and it certainly is a reasonable question to ask. The problem is there's not a great answer. Um, and you know, there's, so the answer is maybe, maybe they will. How do we know? Well, there's a weird formula that the NFL uses to dole out these, these extra picks. I'm not even trying to say that word again. Uh, I should make Siri say it or something like that. Anyway, so that formula depends in part on how much playing time they get at the new team. You know, what level of play they, they accomplish at that new team percentage of time played percentage of snaps it's you know it's that voodoo they do that we don't know about and we aren't really uh, privy to and then they probably sprinkle a little salt on top and call it done right but we don't know the answers yet um, and we won't until after the season is over so we see exactly how much of an impact Jarvis has in Arizona how much of an impact Lawrence Timmons has in uh, Miami if neither Timmons or Jarvis Jones is very productive uh, if one of them gets hurt and is out for the year uh, or they just don't get a lot of playing time because somebody else takes their position well then we probably aren't going to get much of anything for them leaving um, but you know it's possible we could get anywhere up to a third round pick depending on the quality of the play so while it's not really in our benefit I guess it doesn't hurt us to root for you know Jarvis to, to do better in Arizona and really it doesn't hurt us to hope that Timmons does better in Miami um, except if they play us right so uh, the idea is let's cheer for them make them do as best they can and hopefully we end up with a high compensatory pick it's gonna be a third round pick or better or worse excuse me it's not gonna be any better than that that's the earliest round 
Um, but you know, my guess is we're not talking, you know, top tier. If if one of them just manages to really go crazy and makes a Pro Bowl or something, then we might get a third round pick. Uh, but I'd I'd expect fifth if we get anything at all. And it, again, it's debatable. So hopefully that answers that question. Um, the next one comes from Ronnie Blight. Now Ronnie was uh, in a dialogue with Joe uh, Kuzma on the article that dealt with Ryan Shazier's ideas about the rookie contract and how that might need to be renegotiated come the next CBA. And his idea was essentially, what about if we give rookies a two-year option and after two years they can opt out of the contract if they feel like they've overperformed it and they need to, they want to make some, themselves more, you know, get more compensation. And yes, you can understand that for somebody, let's say like Dak Prescott, who certainly overperformed his rookie deal in his first year. We will see what happens in his second year. You know, but you have to remember that there is a reason that this structure was put in place. And that prior to 2010, I believe, rookie contracts were crazy. Sam Bradford's was the last one, and he got $71 million on his rookie deal for six years. That's something like $12 million a year. Would you be happy having paid $12 million a year for Sam Bradford at this point? I don't think so. I don't think so. And that he's not even the worst of the bus. I got two words. Jamarcus. I know that's really one word. Jamarcus. Jamarcus Russell, Oakland Raiders. $60 million for six years, and admittedly he only played three of them, but that cost the Raiders $32 million for those three years. Did Jamarcus Russell provide $32 million in benefit to the Raiders? Of course not. What the problem is, is that rookie contracts got so outrageous by the idea that people were speculating on what these guys could or couldn't be, right? And as they got more and more outrageous, guess what? The salary cap is still the salary cap, and that meant veteran players were not going to get those giant contracts. In order for, you can't have it both ways, right? You can't be throwing $70 million at a rookie first rounder because you don't even know what he's going to do, and then turn around and say, I got to keep Ryan Shazier and Stefan Tuitt and Le'Veon Bell and Antonio Brown and all these vets, right? Because you don't have money anymore. You just spent a whole lot of it on rookies that you have no idea if they're even going to be worth the money. So that's the reason that the system is in place as it is now. Could it be tweaked? Probably. But my question to you, back to you, Ronnie, is this. If there's a two-year option, whose option is it? Now, admittedly, the team can just say, we're going to cut bait here and let you go. They generally don't do that after two years if they've invested a draft pick in somebody, especially a higher draft pick. And to be honest, the likelihood that this is going to benefit High-end draft picks is minimal. Um, I know Shazier is upset because maybe, maybe, and how upset can he be? He's going to get $8 million for his fifth-year contract, I think, for his fifth-year option. But that's his issue is his fifth-year option is getting picked up so he can't make a big payday yet. He's going to have to wait an additional year. But, you know, the Steelers might renegotiate with him during that time frame. But, you know, how much more than $5 million a year was he thinking he was going to get? I don't, I don't know. Or than $8 million, excuse me. Where this could benefit is people who, like let's say Antonio Brown or Alejandro Villanueva, maybe, although he's sort of out of that because he was in a uh, unrestricted, you know, a, a undrafted free agent status, in fact an unrestricted free agent when we picked him up. Um, if somebody like Antonio Brown way outperforms, or Dak Prescott way outperforms their rookie contract, it gives them an out to try and say, look, I've done better than expected. But what's the payoff for the team, okay? So, you know, if the team gives back to the, the player saying, we picked you in the fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh round, and wow, you've been awesome, and we're glad you've been awesome, and now you've decided you want us to pay you more money because for the two years that you were here, you were awesome, what's the kickback for the team? In other words, does, does that mean that the initial salary levels for rookies are going to go down because of the potential offset? Because remember, again, even at two years... That means that if I give money to a two-year player, there may be four and five and six-year players who need renegotiation that I don't have the money to give. It also means that our salary cap numbers start to elevate early. You know, there's a whole formula for all this. So I, while I don't disagree agree with you, Ronnie, and I, and I understand Shazier's concerns, um, it's tough 
to determine what's going to be fair for everybody. So uh, I'm not going to profess to know for sure, but I think uh, it's it'll be interesting to see. I'm sure it will be a point that's brought up at the next uh, bargaining agreement, whether or not anything changes. I don't know. Okay, next question is from Ben Saluri. Now, this is in reference to uh, a recent post by Tommy Jaggi about his 53-man all-time roster, and it's more of a comment. And the comment was, Mike Webster, third string? Uh, no, considering the all-time center, not just for the Steelers. Now, that's not a question. It's a comment, and I'm admitting that I put it in here to give Tommy some grief because he's right. <laughs> Mike Webster... Uh, was an all-timer and I know Tommy's a young pup and he didn't get to watch Webby play um, but for those of us who did I get it but you can't I mean to be honest you can't put Pouncey in front of DeMar and Dawson at this point you got two Hall of Famers sitting behind a guy who is great and fantastic admittedly probably the best center in the league right now he is not a Hall of Famer and he's missed two seasons from injury Dermotti Dawson redefined, redefined the center position. He became one of the first pulling centers ever. Um, and, you know, when you talk about what Dermotti Dawson did, the only difference is he, he never got to win a Super Bowl, and we know that that was because of he who shall not be named. But be that as it may, Dermotti Dawson redefined the center position. And to a certain extent, so did Mike Webster. He was a smaller guy, but he was powerful and strong, and movement was part of his game and being able to move around. Those are differences that the Steelers really changed the way the center position is played. And I, I would agree with you. I could argue that Dermonte Dawson should be one, Webby should be two, Pouncey should be three. Because you got two you cannot put two Hall of Fame centers behind Marquise Pouncey. You can't do it. I'm sorry, Tommy, I don't buy that. Um, I'm calling shenanigans there. Shenanigans, shenanigans. So it's it's questionable. I, in my, my heart would put Webby first. In my heart, Webby is always first, okay? Um, my most prized possession is my Webby helmet that's up there. Webby is first, okay? So, but I, I wouldn't argue strongly that Dermonte Dawson shouldn't be first. But I will argue strongly that uh, Marquise Pouncey is, is number one on the depth charts. He should not be for a 53-man all-time roster. That's my only gripe with your with the article, Tommy. It was a great article. It was nice speculation. You need some breadth. Go back and watch tapes of the older guys. It's worth it. Trust me. Okay. Next question. Joe Triplehorns. Is offensive coordinator for Steelers his next stop? Now, he's re referring to Mike Munchak uh, in the article that was written about Mike Munchak. I, for one, am very curious to see what an O-line coach with his intelligence could do with the whole offense. Whatever is in Coach Munchak's future, I hope it's with the Steelers. Now, I will second that wholeheartedly. Whatever is in his future, I hope it's with the Steelers. But I think one of the things that's been proven out, because you remember, Munchak was the coach of the Titans, and he wasn't that great as a head coach. He wasn't horrible. I'm not going to you know, take anything away from him, but it wasn't his forte. And so the question is, does an offensive lineman uh, guy, does that really project to being an all-knowing offensive coordinator? I like Mike Munchak right where he is. He has, and that's the point of this article, he has reinvented the Steelers offensive line in next to no time, taking them from, you know, second and third tier level play to the top 10 uh, in the league. So I don't even want to put ideas in Mike Munchak's head that he should be an offensive coordinator. He should be a head coach again. Mike, you are maybe a Hall of Fame offensive coordinator. Stay and do that and get these guys even better than they are. Stay there. Joe, be quiet. Stop talking about that other stuff. Okay. Next question or next comment from Vin Huddle. Uh, personally, I can't, this is in, a, a, let me preface, preface this and go back. This is in reference to an article written about the, supposedly the commissioner telling Antonio Brown he needs to celebrate more and the change in the celebration rules. Okay, so Vin says, personally, I can't stand getting overly jacked up for making what's basically a routine should be made play, going crazy over a five yard reception for a first down. Heck no. It seems guys, especially DBs, celebrate they actually did something when a ball was thrown way out of reach of a receiver, LOL. And please don't let touchdown celebrations turn into Soul Train dance line where a handful of guys get a turn. 
there's my rant for the week. Vin, I can't, I can't, I can't agree with you more. I love the idea of opening up celebrations. I think it's been ridiculous, and part of the big reason it's been ridiculous is the poor consistency in officiating it. If if Burfecht running off the field with the ball and several teammates is not the same thing as William Gay doing a dance with several teammates, I don't understand any rule ever because they both involved multiple teammates joining in and uh, you know doing things that seemed inappropriate. That should have been a penalty, but it wasn't. There should be you know a consistency in officiating, and if that's how opening this rule up pr brings a consistency in officiating. You know, I don't even need to go into Antonio Brown's twerk one week is a penalty, but when Emmanuel Sanders tweaks, it's not how many thrusts equates a penalty. I don't know. Um, and I'm I'm a hundred percent with you in the excessive celebration for no reason area. I think when a quarterback overthrows a receiver, the DB did nothing. And well, well, let me go back. He could have overthrown the receiver because the DB was covering him well and still but that's him just doing his normal job when you're just doing what you're supposed to do are you supposed to celebrate to me celebrations should be when you do something extraordinary um, when you catch a routine touchdown pass you know a lot of players think like Heath Miller very rarely did Heath celebrate in fact almost never you know it's it's all dependent on the individual Antonio Brown's celebrations are hilarious. They're fun. They're funny. I'm not going to take them away from him, nor do I think the league should be taking them away from him. Um, but at the same time, yeah, we don't want it to get carried away. Remember, the rule got put in place initially to restrict celebrations because they were becoming storylines in and of themselves. Chad Ochocinco um, would, you know, discuss the celebrations he had planned for the next time he scored in advance. And I think that's crazy, all right? It shouldn't get to that level, but it shouldn't also be taken away back to the levels uh, that they maybe had. And and the key for me is consistency. If they can be consistent with it, I, I'm thrilled. If they can't, then I, they got to figure out how to do that. Okay, Rick Tilves, I hope I'm saying that right, Rick, uh, has two questions. First, uh, if Hunter and Juju make the team justin hunter and juju smith schuster make the team which wide receivers gets cut and if juju goes to the slot does that mean eli rogers will lose his spot that's a good question um the wide receiver room is in my view the most crowded competitive room on the team right now and it's probably more competitive than it's ever been i in my opinion there are two guys who are locked to make the team antonio brown and martavis bryant um i understand that uh you know martavis tweeted out that he ain't he ain't my replacement he's sammy Coates' replacement and sammy said ha 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 and all that nonsense um and i get it you know because there is still a level of trust that needs to be built up with martavis coming back but man does the guy seem like he's gotten it together right he seems like his head is on straight He's had a child, which I can tell you from personal experience, changes you dramatically. It matures you, it humbles you, and it changes the way you view the world, right? And that's the way Martavis seems to me. He is focused. Um, he certainly appears dedicated to his workout, and his work ethic appears Antonio Brown-esque. Uh, and if he comes back and is as good as he looks like he's gonna be, that's fantastic. Okay, so I think AB and MB, the two Bs, will make the team, guaranteed. The question is, how many other receivers are the Steelers going to keep? Um, I've speculated five. I've speculated six. It really depends on other positions and whether they feel like they can't afford to expose somebody on the practice squad and they have to keep them on the 53. There's lots of things that go into it, right? So... Let's say that, that we start with five, right? So the outs, the guys on that need to get those last three positions are Eli Rogers, Sammy Coates, Kobe Hamilton, Justin Hunter, uh, Darius Hayward Bay, Juju Smith Schuster. That's six, six, gee, many Christmas. I can't get my hands on the camera there. Six, that's six guys for three spots. That means three of them aren't gonna be there. Um, even if we went to six, that's four guys for six spots, or six guys for four spots. Man, dyslexic or something there. Um, 
I think that you could probably write Juju Smith-Schuster in to the 53-man roster at this point, unless he's horrible in camp and they decide he needs time on the practice squad. I don't think he gets to the practice squad, and I think they know that. Uh, Second-round picks don't generally go to the practice squad, so I think he makes the roster. If that's the case, now that's three. That's three. There's either only two or three left now. So if that's three positions taken up uh, in this instance, then who's left? So Eli Rogers, let's talk about Eli. I think Eli probably makes the roster um, and probably is in the battle with Juju Smith-Schuster for slot time. Juju can play on the outside too, don't get me wrong, and he could contend out there. Um, and they can use him in some interesting for formations if they go four and five wide. So Eli probably still has the inside track on being the starting slot receiver when the season begins, but I don't know if he will stay there. The idea of having an Anquan Bolden type slot receiver, a big, strong, tough guy, instead of a smaller, you know, ballerina type guy, uh, is, is intriguing. It's intriguing. Plus, it helps the running game because of blocking and everything else. Okay. Justin Hunter. Justin Hunter, in my view, could be on the outside looking in unless he can really establish a great rapport with Ben and show some stuff. And unless the promise that everybody sees in him finally comes to fruition now that he's got a Hall of Fame quarterback throwing to him. He's got a lot to prove in between now and the end of training camp in order to earn that spot. Just because he was signed as a free agent doesn't mean he's making this team. Then you've got Darius Hayward Bay. You've got DeMarcus Ayers. I didn't even think of DeMarcus Ayers. Sammy Coates, Kobe Hamilton. I mean, we have so many receivers, it's insane. Um, I'll tell you, I, I find it unlikely that DeMarcus Ayers makes the team. That seems almost... He and Kobe Hamilton seem to me to be the odd men out for sure. Um, both are practice squad eligible, so they could both end up on the practice squad. And I think you can hide DeMarcus Ayers on the practice squad if they feel that that's what they need to do. Kobe Hamilton doesn't need to hide. I think he can go on the practice squad. And unless somebody is in a dire situation like we were last season, he'll be fine there. Darius Hayward Bay is not practice squad eligible. And Darius Hayward Bay is a special teams uh, monster. And that's his card to play, right? Um, to try and make the team, I think, at this point. He is not going to be one of the guys that they depend on to go out and actually catch the ball. But he's great at special teams. If they've got enough extra special teams guys coming in through rookie deals and, and what, what have you not, you know, uh, other free agent signings, they may not need Darius Hayward Bay, and it may be the end of his time with the Steelers. And then there's Sammy Coates. Um, I think Sammy probably makes the team one more year, for sure, um, and gets a chance to prove that his first half of the season was who he really is, and his second half of the season was all just mental and issues related to him having broken fingers. So we'll see. I, I guess to answer your question, if we end up with Hunter and Juju on the roster, so we have A.B., Martavis Bryant, Juju Smith-Schuster, and Justin Hunter. If those four make the team, who else makes the team? I think in that case, they probably keep six, and Eli and Sammy both make the team. That means Darius Hayward Bay, Kobe Hamilton, and DeMarcus Ayers, gone. Um, or on the practice squad. If they only keep five, then I think Justin Hunter only makes this team if he beats out Sammy Coates. If he doesn't beat out Sammy Coates in training camp, I don't think he makes the team. Um, so we'll see. Now, does that mean that Eli loses his position? As I've said, I think it will mean that maybe down the road, but not necessarily to start it. Juju's going to have to prove it on the field to, to, to earn that spot. Okay. Uh, this is from Steelers for Life, spelled 4L1F3. Uh, and it's a, related to an uh, article about depth, I think, um, and he's talking about Anthony Ciccolo. And he says, I like Ciccolo a lot. He's a good athlete with excellent effort and energy. I think he will hit his stride this year. He has some explosion and some bend. He just needs to put it all together. Ciccolo makes the roster and forces Moats out of town. It's a bold statement. Ciccolo forces Moats out of town. Um, that starts to get into depth for outside linebackers. Uh, and that could be a lengthy conversation in and of itself, just like wide receivers were, because that's another tough room now. We've got some talent there, right? 
you've got J.J. Watt, you've got uh, Arthur Motes, you've got Anthony Ciccolo, Bud Dupree, you've got uh, Keon Adams, who should not be overlooked, uh, and Debo. Can't, Debo will crush my skull if I overlook Debo. Um, that's a, you know, and again, they're probably going to keep four. Uh, I can't see them keeping five outside linebackers. They'll probably keep four, maybe five. Um, but if you've got Debo and Bud, and you've got TJ, and that's three. So now is it one position that you've got Moats and Keon and uh, Chicolo fighting for, or is it two positions? So it's hard to say. Keon Adams is potentially a guy they could hide on the practice squad. Um, seventh round pick, even though I like him a lot and I have been making noise that I think he could slide onto the 53 because I think he could, he's also a guy who could fit on the practice squad um, to develop another year. Uh, I don't think Chicolo can go on the practice squad anymore. I'm not sure. I don't remember uh, all the rules for practice squad, and I have to look it up, which would require effort on my part, and it's Sunday, and I'm tired, and I don't want to. I could, but I don't want to. So I'm not going to. Um, but I think, uh, you know, I don't think Chick's available for practice squad duty at this point. I think he has too much playing time. And I honestly think training camp is, is this is, is Chick's chance to, to prove his point. He played decently when he played last year, but was he a standout? I don't think so. Not really. Um, it's interesting to see, uh, but I think if he has a great camp and he shows up in the preseason games when he gets his chances, I think he makes it. Um, does I think that means Motes is gone? Not necessarily, because uh, they could keep five. Uh, but I think Arthur Motes has has a hard, harder road than most, um, even though he is a veteran and he has, he's a great guy and the personality is fantastic and we don't want him to go anywhere. I think he's got a tough road because he's a little older than some of the other guys and he's only got a, a you know, year or so left on his free agent contract. Okay, um, this is from Jamie Barnhart. And it says, I'm not sure they even need to replace Green, speaking of Ladarius Green. He was never really a reliable game day active between Bryant, Grimble, and James. They have blocking outlets and deep routes all taken care of. Goodbye, Green. Uh, I, I, We've talked about this a little bit too, and Jamie, I don't disagree with you. I'm not sure they need to replace Ladarius Green. Juju, and don't forget Juju in this scenario. Juju Smith-Schuster and, and Martavis Bryant coming back and potentially Justin Hunter making the squad give them a trio of big, tall, strong receivers. And that eliminates a little bit of the, to a certain extent, the loss of Ladarius Green as a big, tall receiver. Um, and don't underplay Xavier Grimble. Don't underplay him. I mean, he's only shown flashes. He's still raw, but the flashes he's shown have been Ladarian, Ladarius-esque. And part of that, as Joe has said a couple times, is because he's running routes that probably were designed for Ladarius Green, but it's giving him opportunity. If he can make strides this season or this training camp, he could be a valid complement to Jesse James. I think Jesse James is the starting tight end, and I think he's done a great job and deserves to be the starting tight end, and he, he is progressing well. Um, but again, don't forget Faison Odom, the 6'8 guy who, who could potentially steal a spot here or could end up on the practice squad, and if we have problems down the road, come in. So we'll see. Uh, but I agree with that statement, Jamie. Uh, now we got a uh, statement from Parker Jensen, and this is in relation to the article or podcast, I can't remember which now, uh, where we talked about Le'Veon Bell's contract. Um, and I made a mistake, I own up to it, and, and Parker corrected me on this, um, which is when I said that if Le'Veon gets another failed test, he's suspended for 10 games a year, whatever it may be. I'm wrong. Parker is right because of the whole way that, that it all worked out. Because remember, Le'Veon never, never failed a drug test. He just missed multiple tests. And because the league was willing to admit some level of wrongdoing on their part, it's only three games. And those three games mean that as a result, it's going to be um, just you know, the same situation. He's only going to maybe miss four games if he gets uh, hit with a, a, a missed test or something again. So we'll see what happens um, down the road. But I, I wanted to thank Parker for, for pointing that out to me. 
Okay, we've got a couple questions here from Steelers Nation 6, and part of these we've already covered. The first one deals with Alejandro Villanueva and says he's in the under contract for this year, and he's not. Um, he has a tender as a restricted free agent of only $650,000 for the year. He hasn't signed it yet, so t technically he is not under contract. But as we've said multiple times, he can't play anywhere else this year and probably not next year. So it's either sit out or play for us. Okay. You also wanted to know, was David Johnson a fullback at one time? And I'm pretty sure the answer to that is yes. There definitely was a David Johnson who was a fullback, and I think it's the same guy. And the last thing you asked was no Kobe Hamilton. And I, again, I think the answer to that is yes. I don't think there's going to be a Kobe Hamilton this year. Uh, I think Kobe has, the, has a very, very, very tough road to make the team, and I don't think so. Um, I'm going to finish up with another uh, comment from Jeff Stipp. Jeff Stipp says, I promise that this is Ben's last year. Y'all don't understand how good Josh Dobbs really is. I hope you are wrong about this being Ben's last year. I do not want to throw a Hall of Fame quarterback out the door um, for a possible rookie. Now, I'm going to also tell you, I've watched uh, Josh Dobbs' tape, and I don't see it. I see what I've always seen, a possible developmental backup who could be a starter but not potentially a Hall of Fame starter. So that's the way I look at that. Now this is our first edition of Fan Mail. Uh, hopefully you enjoyed it. Let's, uh, you know, again, send in your emails to fanmail at steelcityunderground.com or go ahead and shoot us a call at the uh, hotline or just post your comments and say, hey, can you answer this in Fan Mail? Anything you want to talk about, we're willing to talk about. Hope you have a great day and be safe, be good, and we'll talk to you next time. We would like to thank you for listening and remind our listeners to follow us on social media and our website, www.steelcityunderground.com.